So some cities have begun to do this uh, already, and San Francisco was the first city that tried these demand-based prices. Unfortunately, they, they hired graphic designers to show people uh, what it's going to be like. Uh, typically, people uh, see that in, in some blocks that there are no open spaces, and on other blocks there, there are several open spaces. Uh, so the, what I recommend is you nudge up the price on the top block and nudge down the price on the, on the bottom block. So that you, by moving one space, one car from a crowded block to um, an uncrowded block, you make both blocks work better and somebody will have to uh, maybe walk a block or two to get to their final destination. But it's much better than now when many people come and there are no open spaces. Now, some people think that charging market prices for curb parking will be some wrenching social change, almost as cataclysmic as the Reformation or Prohibition. But if a city can't adjust prices to get one or two open spaces on every block, what can it do? I mean, how can you feel that the city is, is competent if they can't just nudge prices up or down? We could call this pricing policy the Goldilocks principle of parking prices. As children, we learned uh, that porridge shouldn't be too hot or too cold, and that beds shouldn't be too soft or too hard. Similarly, if no parking spaces are vacant, th the price is too low. Uh, and if many spaces are vacant, the price is too high. But if about 15% of the spaces are occupied, the price is just right. And uh, pricing will perform the essential role of keeping just a few uh, spaces available everywhere, so no one will have to hunt for curb parking. Well, San Francisco uh, started this program. They were the first city to do it, and they had a grant from the federal government to try it out. I think the wise thing they did was to hire a graphic designer, uh, a video designer, to, to create a video showing people how this program will work. It's a lot easier to do it in video than in real life, but this shows you what they're trying to do. Well, what happened after uh, San Francisco tried this? The biggest surprise in SF Park, as the name of the program, is that the average price of parking declined. Um, they have the test group and we have the control group, both on street and off street. And the price for, for on street parking went down slightly. That's just a few cents. It means it's essentially the same. Well, why is that? Uh, well, because if the prices are the same all day long, They'll be too high at some times and too low at other times, and rarely just right. But when San Francisco began reducing the price in the morning, when there were plenty of vacant spaces, they reduced it by 25 cents uh, an hour uh, in each adjustment, and they make an adjustment about every three months. So it took quite a while for the prices to go down from the initial price, which is two or three dollars an hour, to 25 cents an hour, which was the lowest price in, in the, in the uh, program. So uh, the, the many blocks went down to 25 cents an hour in the morning. Uh, and they went up a bit in the midday and the late afternoon when the demand was higher. But when you average it all out, the, the average price was almost the same before and after. And that's because many blocks had been overpriced in the morning. And I think it's better to have the right price in the morning. So if people want to drive to a coffee shop or do shopping in the morning, they would get a much lower price. It is better that people take advantage of these uh, times when most people don't want to park there. And the average cruising time declined by about, um, well, 43% in the test area and not very much in the control area. There was a beginning of a recession, so you think that maybe cruising would decline anyway. But uh, one of the other uh, advantages is that the number of tickets declined. When the prices are too low, crowded curb parking, these drivers to double park or block fire hydrants or park at bus stops, and demand price parking can reduce these violations. There was one study in New York that looked at the number of violations as a function of occupancy. And when the prices went up and the occupancy declined just by 5%, from 100% occupied to 95% occupied, 
the number of parking violations declined by 50%. Uh, because if somebody can see a, a legal space, they're probably not going to risk a ticket for a much higher price um, if they park in front of a fire hydrant. And the, the, the right prices for curb parking, the right prices have also reduced conflicts between drivers and enforcement officers and, and reduced injuries and even murders that result from uh, disputes among drivers over scarce curb spaces. Uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions declined. As you can see in this graph, there was a 30% decrease in their estimated uh, amount of emissions, which is very important. When you think of cruising around the world, how, many, how much emissions are caused by cars driving around hunting for a curb parking space? And it's so easy to, get re to, to reduce it. And the um, vehicle miles traveled declined, and that reduces traffic congestion and accidents and a double parking decline. Why would you need to double park if there are open curb spaces? So that's a double parking blocks a whole lane of traffic. It, it also makes it difficult if all the curb spaces are occupied, Uber and Lyft drivers let out their passengers and take them in the traffic lane, which is not safe, and it blocks a lane of traffic. Uh, so it isn't just the driving for cruising that's reduced, but also the blocking lanes for d double parking. And some people think that if you start charging for parking, it'll hurt business. But the uh, sales tax revenue increased uh, just as soon as this program started. And it happens elsewhere as well. But once you start charging for curb parking, uh, the sales tax don't go down, they go up because the spaces are available to people who are going to shop in the area rather than the, the, the merchants and their employees who park on the street and then complain about the lack of parking for their customers. So getting the price of curb parking right uh, will help uh, business and that, of course, leads to higher employment for people who work at the, the stores and the restaurants. And, and there is revenue for the city. So no one will say that parking is a nightmare or it's hard to find a space. And th that makes a, a business district work better. So San Francisco gives the best of both worlds. When the SF Park program began, they had a grand uh, ceremony at the, at the San Francisco City Hall in which all the supervisors uh, uh, and the elected officials took credit for the, this new way to charge for parking. It's hard to think of politicians wanting to claim credit for, for variable prices for parking meters, but they all wanted to be associated with it. And uh, they asked me to speak as well. And I said that the SF Park gives San Francisco the best of both worlds. If it worked well, it would make San Francisco an even better place to live and visit and do business. Uh, be another feather in the San Francisco's cap. And if it doesn't work well, they can blame it all on a professor from Los Angeles. Uh, so how could you get a better uh, choice of, of two outcomes? And other cities have followed San Francisco's lead in charging demand-based prices for some or all of their curb spaces, including Arlington, Virginia, and Baltimore, and Boston, and Calgary, and Los Angeles, and Mexico City, and Pittsburgh, and Seattle, and Washington, D.C. It's something that any city can copy, that you're not going to be the first city to try this out, but you shouldn't be the last, I think.